Chair, we are now live. Thank you. Thank you. Right, welcome to the virtual meeting of the Development Control Committee. It is 6 p.m. on Thursday, the 21st of May, 2020. My name is Councillor Lee Bentley, and I am the chair of this committee, and my fellow councillor, Councillor Linda Broadley, is the vice chair. In accordance with the regulations made under Section 78 of the Coronavirus Act 2020, this remote meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The audio visual recording will be made available on the council's website and YouTube channel shortly after the meeting. <clears throat> All meeting participants are reminded to speak slowly and clearly in the direction of their device's microphone at all times. A reminder that mobile phones and other electronic devices should be turned off or put on silent mode and those participating in the meeting should refrain from taking telephone calls. For the purpose of recording of attendance, I can confirm that the following councillors are, are present and participating in this remote meeting. Myself, Lee Bentley, Bill Bolter, the Vice Chair, Linda Broadley, Frank Broadley, Samia Hack, Kriti Joshi, Jeffrey Kaufman, Kerr Kozlowski, Helen Lloydo, Richard Morris, and Ian Ridley. We also have the following officers in attendance. Samuel Ball, trainee solicitor, who is acting as the Democratic Services Officer. David Gill, the Head of Law and Democracy and Monitoring Officer. Alex Matthews, the Planning Control Officer. Richard Redford, the Development Control Manager. Adrian Thorpe, the head of built environment, and Steve Tucker, the democratic and electoral services manager. And finally, we also have the following registered public speakers in attendance. Councillor Naveed Allen, who is ward councillor for the Obi Grange ward. Tom Ayres, the agent for applications concerning Soton Farm Park and Miles Drew, the agent for the application concerning HM Young Offenders Institute. For the purpose of the regulations, I can confirm that before this meet, remote meeting went to live, all participants confirmed that they can see or hear all of the other participants. Any councillor participating by remote link who declares a disclosable pecuniary interest in any items of business on tonight's agenda will be required to leave a remote meeting for the duration of the item. The departure will be confirmed by Democratic Services, who will then invite the relevant councillor to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. Should the hosting technology fail during this meeting, I will call an adjournment of up to 15 minutes to determine whether the connection can be re-established. If the connection cannot be re-established after 15 minutes, the meeting shall stand adjourned to a later date to be confirmed. In the event of connection failure for an individual councillor, the meeting will proceed providing it remains quiet, i.e. the minimum number of councillors remain connected, which for this meeting is four. Should the meeting no longer be quiet, it shall be adjourned and for any remaining items of business will stand deferred to a later date to be confirmed. Any councillor who has been absent from the debate on a particular item due to connection failure or any other reason will not be permitted to vote on that item, as they will not have heard all the facts. <clears throat> councillors must indicate their wish to speak by raising, using the raise hand function in Zoom. Democratic Services and I will work in tandem to invite each member to speak in the order that their hand was raised. Registered public speakers, including ward councillors, will have their microphone unmuted at the point where they are invited to speak only. They will each have a maximum of, of five minutes per application to speak. Democratic services will be responsible for timekeeping and will notify the speaker when they have one minute remaining. Before proceeding to the vote on any given planning application, I will ensure that all councillors and officers have no further comments to make by confirming with democratic services that no hands remain raised. And I will clarify that motion is being voted upon. 
Democratic services will call each councillor's name in alphabetical order by surname, and each councillor will confirm whether they are voting for, against, or abstaining on the item. Democratic services will record each response and once all councillors have voted, confirm the outcome of the vote. In respect of voting on all of our housekeeping items on the agenda, for example, the approving of the minutes of the previous meeting, I will ask councillors to raise their hands on Zoom. And if all hands are raised, those items will be agreed by general affirmation. Finally, may I politely remind all participants that they must not act in a disorderly or disruptive manner or otherwise interfere with the committee's proper conduct of its business. Thank you. <clears throat> right, moving on, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. One apology from Councillor Amandeep Kaur. Thank you. Any appointments of substitutes? There are no substitutes, Chair. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Kozłowski. Um, yes, I just want to declare um, application um, number A, HM Young Offenders Institute, declare an interest due to my employer. Thank you. Chair, Minister. I have Councillor Samia Hack indicating a, de a declaration also. Okay, Councillor Hack. Thank you, Chair. I would like to declare an interest in agenda item two. Um, I was one of the consultees on that application and um, I think I have personal interest. Um, I'd like to ask a question though. Um, am I able to ask some questions at the start of that agenda item or is that not possible? Mr Gill? Thank you, Chair. No, unfortunately, that's not possible. You're declaring an interest, which is a pecuniary interest, because of the impact that that development site will have on your property. And therefore, as soon as the item is called, you, you can have to leave the meeting, my friend. OK, in that case, Chair, I will be um, present for the first agenda item and I will leave for the second once that's finished. OK, thank you. No other declarations of interest? No further hands raised, Chair. Okay. Minutes of the previous meeting. May they be signed? Councillor Broadley. If members wish to approve the minutes of the previous meeting, can you raise your hand virtually? And then we will take each councillor by exception. I see all hands raised apart from Councillor Joshi. I'm going to unmute Councillor Joshi to check in to see whether she wishes to, wishes to make any comment, Chair. Councillor Joshi. Joshi. I'm trying to find my uh, thing to do it, actually. Sorry. Give me two seconds. I'm just... I did it earlier. Where am I? Where am I? Chat. For the purposes of this vote, Councillor Joshi, can you confirm? Um, yes, I'm happy to. That you are. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let me figure this one. Okay, moving on then. Agenda item number one. We have a speaker, Mr. Drew. Chair, I'm going to now invite Mr. Drew um, as an active participant in the meeting, um, if you allow. Uh, a few seconds to ensure that he's joined successfully. <clears throat> Mr. Drew, can you hear me okay? Uh, good evening, Chair. Yes, I can. Okay, you have five minutes and we'll give you the nod when you've got one minute left. Okay, okay. thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, members. Uh, so my name is Miles Drew and I'm from Averson Young. I'm pleased to be presenting to you again on behalf of my client, Lendlease, following your decision on the 27th of February 
to grant planning permission for the kitchen building at the new prison. The application that is being presented tonight seeks approval of the reserved matters. When outline planning permission was granted in 2017, the scale of development, that is the maximum amount of floor space and the maximum height of buildings was approved, as was the means of access. The outline consent confirmed that the new prison will be accessed only via Tigers Road, both during the construction period and when the prison becomes operational. The layout, landscaping and the external appearance of the new buildings were reserved for future determination and it is those matters which are addressed by the application that is being presented for consideration this evening. As members will know, and is, as confirmed in the officer's report, the site straddles the boundary of Opium Wigston Borough and Blaby District, and we submitted identical reserved matters applications to both authorities. As members will also be aware, only a very small part of the site, and therefore the scheme, is in Opium Wigston, comprising new landscaping, a new small section of road that serves the new visitor parking in Edgeville, mm. and the eastern boundary, including the section alongside Crete Avenue. As a consequence, the issues for Opium Wigston to consider are quite narrow. For further reference, on the 28th of April, Blaby District Council approved the reserve mm. map application that we had submitted to it, having concluded that the design and external appearance of the new buildings are acceptable, and that the proposed landscaping would help, say, help safeguard residential amenity. With all of this in mind, my client is therefore very pleased that the reserve matters application that we have submitted to your authority has also been recommended for approval. Members will hopefully recall that in 2018, a reserve matters scheme was promoted by InterServe Construction Limited on behalf of the MOJ, and for which we were also the planning consultant. The InterServe proposals were approved by this committee on the 26th of July 2018. I note this because the scheme which has been submitted by Lendlees for approval tonight is very similar to the InterServe scheme. For Opium Wigston, this means that it remains the case that the new prison car park will be located in the northeastern part of the application site, served by a short access road that connects the car park to Tigers Road. Both the MOJ and Lendlease recognise the importance of the boundary treatment to the eastern part of the site, particularly in the section north of Tigers Road that separates the site from Crete Avenue. Since 2016, three separate consultation events have been organised by the MOJ, all with our support. As a consequence, we, the MOJ and Lendlease, fully understand the desire of the residents of Crete Avenue for a secure, impermeable boundary to be installed that will prevent access to the prison on their right. When that land planning permission was granted, a condition was imposed at the request of this committee to ensure that details of the eastern boundary treatment were submitted to the council for approval, while a further condition required the existing treatment to remain in situ until the approved alternative was installed. A condition was also attached to the reserve matters approval granted to InterServe requiring details of boundary treatment, and your officers have once again recommended such a condition be attached if reserve matters approval is granted tonight. It is important to say that Lendlease, in conjunction with the MOJ, is preparing details to submit to the council in respect of those conditions. One minute if, remaining, Chair. If members do resolve to approve reserve matters this evening, then Lendlease anticipates being able to commence development over the coming months. It has already begun the process of discharging conditions attached to the outline planning permissions in order to facilitate this. So in summary, both Lendlease and the MOJ are pleased with the recommendation for approval <coughs> following Blaby's decision to approve the reserve matters. But wherever the issues to very being recent to consider are narrow, the eastern boundary treatment is important and the relevant details will be submitted to the council in due course. In the light of the foregoing, I therefore respectfully request that members approve the application in accordance with the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drew. Chair, do any members have any points of clarification only for Mr. Drew? If you do, please indicate by raising your hand virtually. No, thank you, Mr. Drew. I'm now going to um, place you back uh, in, un under the attendee list and you can continue to view uh, the proceedings from there. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Right, for the matter of the record, the application we are looking at is 19 forward slash 00474 forward slash REM, Reserved Matters, HM Young Offenders Institute, Glen Parva, Tigers Road, Wigston, Leicestershire. Mr. Matthews, would you like to present your report, please? Mr. Matthews, if you give me two seconds whilst I share on screen the uh, planning presentation. Mr. Matthews, can you see the presentation on your screen? Yes, I can see that. Thank you. You can begin to present your report. Okay, thank you, Chair. Hello, for those that don't know me, my name is Alex Matthews and I'm a Planning Control Officer here at OGB and Wigston Borough Council. I'm the Case Officer for this planning application currently under consideration today. The application that we're looking at is a reserve matter submission for the demolition of the existing HMYOI Glen Parva and construction of a new prison with a secure perimeter fence together with access, parking, energy centre, landscaping and associated engineering works considering the appearance, landscaping and layout. To start with, if we could flip to slide number four, please, with some photos on, that would be ideal. Okay, the photographs presented on this slide all present the furthest western part of Tigers Road at the entrance to the site under consideration. The site that we are looking at is currently a cleared vacant site beyond the metal fencing presented on those photos, with Tigers Road being the access, obviously being where those, take, where those photos are taken from. If you could flick over to slide number four, Five next, please. Okay. These four photographs are taken at the junction between Saffron Road and Tigers Road. The top two pictures are looking west down, Tiger, down Tigers Road towards the site entrance that was shown on the slide just before. The bottom left and right look mm. south and north along Saffron, Saffron Road. Okay. Right, can you go to slide number six, please? <clears throat> right, this slide presents a site location plan with the red line outlining the application site and the blue line also outlining um, land under the ownership of the MOJ. Slide number seven, please. This slide presents the local authority boundary map. The red line presents the site boundary, as you could have made up from the um, slide before as well. The green dotted line presented down the right hand side presents the Odeon Wigton Borough Council administrative boundary line. So the area to the east of that side is within Odeon Wigston. Borough Council, and that's the elements within that area that are today mainly up for consideration. Um, if we go to the next slide as well, please. This slide presents a proposed block plan. The building footprints are presented in grey, and we've got 12 buildings excluding ancillary structures that are situated within the Blaby District Council administrative area, which was the left hand side of the line, of the green line that I just mentioned before. Right. To start with here now, I'm just going to outline a few site and location descriptive factors. The application site under consideration is partly within the western edge of the administrative area of Obi and Wigston Borough Council. The majority of the site falls within the administrative area of Labour District Council. Only access along Tigers Road and the section running along the eastern edge of the site falls within Opie and Wigston. The elements within this Opie and Wigston section include a small section of visitor parking, 
an area of amenity grassland element of perimeter fencing as well. The application site is approximately 16.3 hectares in size and is currently a cleared vacant site with secure perimeter fencing still intact. Surrounding the application site are a range of different uses. These include industrial units, army buildings, offices, a nursery, and residential dwellings. To the north of the site under consideration is an area of amenity and recreational space beyond the land to the north owned by the MOJ, which was outlined in blue on the, um, on the slide earlier. To the south, if the site under consideration, the railway acts as the site's southern boundary. To the west, residential dwellings and a school are situated. And with regards to land levels, land levels are generally higher to the north and slope <coughs> down to the southwestern corner. The submission hereby under consideration today relates to the outline application under the reference of 1600575 out which was permitted in September 2017. This permission authorised the demolition and construction of a new category C adult male prison with a minimum floor space of 62,437 square metres which was approved. This reserve matters application hereby, the application we're looking at today is also the resubmission of a, a previous reserve matters application under the reference of 18002030REM. That approved details of 18 buildings in July, 2018. In terms of the description of proposal, for the current reserve matters submission as a whole. The reserve matters is seeking to alter the previously approved reserve matters submission. These alterations include the removal of the kitchen block. This has since been approved in February under the reference 19.00475 full in a separate application. We've got the relocation of ancillary structures, the removal of some buildings to the north of the compound, and the reconfiguration of residential blocks. A total of 12 buildings excluding the ancillary structures are proposed. The northern section of the site comprises of a variety of buildings. So we've got building 102, which is an entrance and resource hub, 104, a supporting building, 105, central services hub, 108, a workshop, 110, a care and support, a support unit, 111. So buildings labeled 111, there's seven of those buildings in total and they are residential blocks with associated offices towards the south of the site. There's also 430 car parking spaces situated towards the north of the site, over towards the east as well, closer to the boundary shared with um, Hopi and Wigston. Um, those car parking spaces include 63 spaces for visitors and 367 spaces for staff. It's it's the role of Blavey District Council to consider um, the outline built form and the potential implications of these buildings in terms of design character and appearance implications, for example, and impacts on neighbouring amenity. And the reason for that is because these buildings are situated within the Blavey District Council administrative area. It is important to note here that Blavey District Council I've not so long ago approved the scheme of development and I believe that was approved 
at the end of April this year. If we could flick over to slide number nine, please. Right, slide number nine. Okay, on this one, I'd just firstly like to point out that there is a minor error with the labeling that I've added to the right-hand side. So we've got the text that presents site section FF and site section GG. They are actually, they should be the other way around if that makes sense. And then if we could go to the, so these have labeled, these label the location for some sections that are on the slides below. And they show the locations where the sections are taken from. Taken from. So if we could look at the following slide, number 10, please. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, the sections presented at the top here um, are looking south towards the southeast corner of the site. And this is closer towards um, Hopi and Wigston Borough Council area, which is why I've incorporated it on the slides here today. Section below that, GG, is looking towards the northwest across the northeastern quarter of the application site. The following slide, number 11, if you could flick over to that one as well, please. Thank you. This one presents a comprehensive landscape master plan. So showing the whole of the um, sort of landscape and details under consideration and the um, site overall. Right. In terms of the elements that fall within the Oakby and Wigston Borough Council administrative area, this is a relatively narrow strip on the eastern side of the site, as I mentioned earlier, highlighted by the dotted green line. So the elements within Oakby and Wigston and up for consideration today include a small section of internal road to the parking area, a strip of landscaping, three ancillary structures situated just inside the entrance and that's just to the north of the entrance as well and boundary treatments in terms of surfacing proposed the proposed internal road and car park have been labeled on the submitted landscape master plan as being finished <coughs> with macadam servicing landscaping treatments include a variety of trees hedges and shrubs the three ancillary structures from north to south have been labelled as 113E and 113D and 114 below that. So as mentioned, they're situated just inside to the north of the main entranceway. In terms of boundary treatments, the red line to the northeast has been labelled as facilitating new boundary treatments. From the northeast corner of the application site to the boundary to the north of Tigers Road. So these elements of the boundary have been labelled as new boundary treatments and has however been limited information submitted with regards to that. So we've not got any elevational details at this stage. And as mentioned earlier, it's worth it's worth referencing that um, these um, details are to support are to be submitted shortly by the applicant in terms of approval of conditions requests, previous applications. Comments and representations are as per the original agenda. In terms of the consideration and consultation comments, that's also as per the original agenda. Just to summarise the consultation comments, Environmental Health Department have presented no major concerns. They would, however, like to review new boundary treatments when they are submitted at that stage. We've got no major concerns from Ecology at County Council and the Environment Agency in Leicestershire Police. So they've all outlined that stance and that's been documented. The Highways Department at the County Council have um, inputted their professional opinion and they've deemed the impacts of the proposal on the road network and highway safety to not be severe. Overall, the proposed scheme was deemed by the highways department to not conflict with the national planning policy framework. Um, 
and they basically summarised and said that they're happy with the scheme subject to the incorporation of a condition, which would um, ensure that parking and turning facilities are implemented in accordance with the plans. The Lead Local Flood Authority and Seven Trent Water have outlined no major concerns. They Conditions have, however, been um, advised and attached with regards to drainage methods, disposal of surface water, and disposal of foul sewage. One comment of representation from a resident at Crete Avenue, as outlined in the initial agenda as, as published. Um, overall, the local planning authority considers the proposed scheme to be policy compliant. <coughs> This is subject to planning conditions as per the original agenda. And those conditions have been documented in that agenda in full. Um, so just to summarize what these, what, how these are kind of headed up. Um, condition one, requiring plans and elevations of the Eastern site boundary treatment between the northernmost point and Tigers Road to be submitted to and agreed by a local planning authority to um, retain control of that. Details of the ancillary structures situated just inside the entrance way, just to the north of Tigers Road in terms of location. Um, implementation of parking and turning facilities as per the recommendation by highways. Details of sustainable drainage systems to be submitted and agreed. Details of um, disposal of surface water and foul sewage to be submitted and agreed. Um, and then condition six is a standard um, schedule of approved plans list. So overall, subject to those conditions, planning approval that has been recommended <coughs> by myself and then obviously brought forward to this planning committee, planning approval recommended, um, subject to conditions. So that's all from my part. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Councillor Bolter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, one or two questions. Um, I'm heartened by what the uh, agent said regarding the landscaping uh, and the wall. We do need a solid fence there, a solid wall there, so we don't have the car headlight shining through into Crete Avenue. But it also raises the question, I raised this last mm. time, and oh, that there's an area of grass outside the wall, and uh, who's going to be maintaining that in future? And also, they also own some lights which are along that boundary uh, outside the wall, but they are owned by what well, were owned previously by the previous occupants. I assume <coughs> they're going to take those over as well. And the greatest concern really is the, the radio mast. How far away from the residence is that going to be? How tall is it? What visual impact is that going to have on, on the area? Bearing in mind this is a residential area. Um, that seems to have just crept in fairly recently about this big radio mast. So there uh, are just a few things that um, concern me, but um, we are where we are with this application. Um, all we can do is the best for our residents and uh, hopefully that the um, developer will take the residents' views on board and mitigate all the circumstances you possibly can. But I'm still concerned regarding this, uh, this wall and um, I'm hoping to see a plan sometime what it's going to look like because we've now been going three years is it been talking about the wall nobody's shown us a design what it's going to be yet um so i'll wait with anticipation thank you councillor bolter mr matthews would you like to comment on the three items councillor bolter raised the grass maintenance the lights ownership and maintenance and the radio mast height position. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the boundary treatments, obviously the agent has um, outlined that he's currently working on preparing a submission with regards to presenting the details of those boundary treatments so we can get those, um, get those properly assessed and considered um, in conjunction with um, looking at surrounding locality and considering what would be appropriate in terms of materials with regards to walling or fencing. That's something that we can look at in detail once the documentation has been submitted. Um, 
with regards to the radio mast, the, that element of the proposed scheme, obviously being approved by Blaby District Council with it falling further into the site. They've obviously considered that in terms of design, character and appearance, impact on neighbouring community, for example, and deem that to be appropriate. With regards to the maintenance of the grass, that is something that I can have a conversation with um, on your behalf and um, just update the agent um, with regards to that being a concern of the residents. So hopefully we can kind of get some clarity on, on that issue. Um, the final point, I think what you outlined was potential impact for light shining through the fence into Crete Avenue. Again, that's something that we could have a look at when we're looking at the materials for the boundary treatment and kind of hopefully all work together and achieve something that's appropriate and kind of meets the needs of, of everybody in general, if possible. It's something we could look at. So hopefully that okay. partly answers the questions. Hopefully. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Councillor Balti, would you like to come back on that or are you happy? Uh, no, I'm not happy at all about the application, but not that I know about it. Um, it's just the boundary treatment does concern me, and ongoing maintenance of the outside area concerns me. Um, it's all right for Blaby District to uh, approve the mass. They're not the residents going to be affected by it. So I wouldn't imagine they'd be too worried about our residents, um, but we are. So, you know, I still don't know how big the mast is, how high it is, and exactly where the location is going to be. So that does concern me. We'll see if we can get you those details separately, Councillor Bolter. Okay. Councillor Morris. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, really. The... Regarding the drainage, again, as previously mentioned on all of the other applications, can we have a note to applicant or, or something along those lines regarding the drainage issues that was previously experienced by the, the prison that was there and regards to the drainage into Crete Avenue where forever they were getting blocked and everything. So if there's something that can be done around that to ensure that the drainage is, a, is away from the Crete Avenue in the old army barracks housing estate, that would be beneficial to the residents. And it's something that whenever we've spoken to the residents, that's always brought up. Uh, the, other, the other thing, Councillor Bolter spoke about uh, the wall and the area at the top of Crete Avenue, which I believe is a shift in Sandberg and has a cherry tree planted in there. The other thing Mr. Bolter um, mentioned about is that there's a, a, a lamppost with a light, which the, the, the old prison, uh, they forgot about it and they never did any of the upkeep, changed the light bulbs. And we had the residents that used to change the light bulbs in, in the lamppost for lighting because of that. So there needs to be something regarding that and who's going to take ownership of that for, for the residents because they cannot continue to climb ladders with, and change the light bulbs so that they've got street lighting. So the prison needs to take on the responsibility for that, as well as the boundary. Um, I know, obviously, that the times of construction may well be changed to what suits them, but I'd still like to have something put on that and that they would then have to come to us to amend that rather than give them a, a free-for-all. I'd like to continue with the times of construction and have something put on there um, that's agreeable by both. But, and if they need to amend that at any stage, they come back to us on that. So, uh, you know, whatever we've previously put on over the times we've approved these applications, if we can continue down the same line at the same times. Now, I know the government have said that they, they that we should be flexible on that. And I'm not saying not to, but if they want to decide to work longer, perhaps they could come back to us and we can agree that at a later date. But at least we've got a starting point. And, and finally, with the regard to the boundaries, again, is it possible that myself as the local councillor who sits on development control and, and Councillor Bolter as the local county councillor could perhaps be consulted when the, the plans come forward? Um, because we, we can speak to the residents of the old army barracks and see what their thoughts on them before we just blanket approve them. So I'd like to see if, that, if, if that's a possibility, myself and Councillor Bolter. I'm happy for the other councillors, my other fellow ward councillors to be involved as well if required, but... I'd like to know what's going to happen with the boundaries because I know it's a sticking issue, sticky point with 
with the residents of the old army barracks. So if we can get something that's agreeable by all, that would be really appreciated. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Chair. OK. Mr Matthews, do you have any comments on, on that? Or Mr Gill, do you have any comments on Councillor Morris? If you bear with me, Chair, I'm just looking at the Constitution as to who the power to uh, discharge conditions lies with. I think it lies with the Deputy Chief Exec. There's no reason why that being the case, that consultation can't take place, but ultimately the decision will be um, whoever has the delegated power. So if you can just bear with me one second while I just have a quick look. Okay. While you're looking at that, Mr Redford or Mr Matthews, what is your opinion on limiting the hours of work? Uh, is that I've... acceptable, taking into account that even if we limit the hours of work, we've got to be flexible under the new governmental guidelines? If I can jump in there, Chair, um, on the outline permission, condition 19 specified hours of construction and hours of work as being between 8am and 6pm Monday to Friday, as well as between 8am and 1pm on Saturdays, with nothing on Sundays or bank holidays. In terms of the developers wanting to elongate those um, in line with the, the guidance that's come out from government recently, in theory, there wouldn't be a problem with that, but we would need details and an explanation in order for us to consider to then go back on. So in that sense, I wouldn't really see a problem to be flexible while still protecting residential amenities. Um, if I can just also address a couple of other points that have been raised by both Councillor Morris and Councillor Bolter. With regards to the mast, um, details in terms of the location was actually shown on the previous reserve matters submission as well um, at the, the, the top of the development site also within the baby side um, so th th there's that there with regards to lighting concerns we also have con a condition on the uh, condition seven of the outline that requires details of lighting be submitted and approved so that we can actually make sure that the, the level of lighting is appropriate to the residents as is the actual direction it is facing that so we've got those covered up by way of the outline permission as well. So I hope that answers those bits satisfactorily, Chair. Thank you. Are you happy with that, Councillor Morris? Yes, Chair. Just need uh, and if I can come back, back in, Chair, uh, the delegated power to determine conditions does lie with the Deputy Chief Executive. There's no reason why he can't consult with members, but obviously ultimately the final decision will be down to uh, the Deputy Chief Exec or the officer that he's delegated the power to further. Okay, thank you. Are you happy with that, Councillor Morris? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy for that. I obviously understand that. I'm happy if you can solve myself and, Ms. and Councillor Bolter uh, regarding that. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hack. Thank you, Chair. I was going to get some clarification regarding the consultation on this application further. Um, do our resident, do we know how many residents were consulted on this application? Does it take a standard form of consultation like with any other application or does it have a reduced form of consultation because we are not the determining authority? And also, does Blavie District Council um, consult our resident when they um, have when they determine the application? Mr. Matthews or Mr. Redford? Um, I am just logging into the system to get the actual figures to answer that question from our point of view. With regards to Blaby's consultation, I, I, I would have hoped they would have consulted our residents. I know we consulted theirs um, on the outline as well as put up site notices in the Blaby and Leicester City's areas on the, on the outline uh, to make sure that everyone actually had the opportunity to make um, comments. With regards to this submission, if you bear with me a moment. We, a total of 271 letters were sent out um, from us, which I believe 
will be comparable with what was sent out on the previous reserve matters and the outline application. So we've been extensive and it would appear we've done the same neighbours throughout for continuity and, and openness so that everyone who was consulted originally still has the opportunity to, to make comments on, on all, the, all these submissions. Thank you. Councillor Hack, you'd like to come back? Uh, just, just for a second, Chair. Yes. Um, did we have the same number of letters um, in response to the last consultation or is that uh, reduced now? Um, 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 I will just get that one. Sorry, I'm using the computer to get the, uh, the details up. On the previous reserve matters. Okay, just give me clarification uh, on whether the concerns have been dealt with. Uh, the number of representations has fallen from five to one. Okay. Okay, Councillor Hack. Yes, happy with that. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lloydell. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And can I say, say thank you to Alex for his very comprehensive um, report there, detailed report. However, um, I do and I have stressed in, in the past my concern as to why Odeby and Wigston Borough Council is giving permission for this development. Technically, and I'll be corrected by Mr Gill if I'm wrong, I'm quite sure he will. Uh, technically, I don't think Odeby and Wigston has the authority to give permission for the development which is in Blaby District and is up to Blaby District to give permission for. I believe that we should only be given permission for the areas which are within our remit. Um, which is Tigers Road, and unfortunately that bit of um, which was given permission last time for the dining rooms. Um, so that's my question, first of all. Secondly, I'd like to ask the question, have we checked that the hours of work which we have specified tie up with those that will have been given by Blaby District or will we be at odds with them? Um, and finally, why is it that if this council gives permission for this development, why haven't we made sure that those areas which are within our remit have also been sorted out and have not been left to a later date to be sorted out at a later date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thanks, Chair. If I can come back in, in there then. Um, Councillor Loyal, you are correct that we can only deal with matters that fall within the, the boundaries of the borough. Um, so <clears throat> whilst comment has been made, for instance, on the... Um, Radio mass, that's nothing that we have any influence over. That's entirely a matter for, for Blaby. In terms of the hours of work, uh, it was made clear earlier in the presentation that the only source of access to the site will be via Tigers Road. So irrespective of what working conditions or, or times Blaby have, the vehicles have to pass along Tigers Road to get to the site and they will be controlled by the condition that we have in terms of working hours. With regard to the issues around sorting matters out with respect to um, the, the light and the, the, the boundary, that's been an ongoing matter. And as has already been said, things have changed over time. We originally had the kitchen um, building, which is gone, and things have moved around. And it's normal in those circumstances that the boundary treatment is generally the last thing that is, is decided because it's influenced by what has happened within the site. And of course, the applicant has to agree that boundary treatment with the authority <coughs> before the permission can be implemented. So um, I think all of those things are, are, are covered off as we would normally do. Councillor Lloyd, would you like to come back? Um, yes, I did ask about the hours um, of work tying up with Blaby um, 
district have that have they been sorted out and they're both working to the same hours or well, will the, we be having the reality is so the reality is council Lloydell, to get into the site they've got to go across tigers road and, and the condition that has been imposed by us will control their access so irrespective of what they've agreed with blaby if they are doing something um, that infringes the condition that we have with regard to the hours of work and access, then we can prevent it because we can prevent people going on, on, on site. So basically, is it within our power, Councillor Lloyd, also our hours of work are substantive? I have no doubt then Councillor Bolton will be making sure that they adhere to those hours, Chair. I would expect him to. Okay. We have no more speakers. Um, the officer's recommendation is to grant. Um, I will formally move that recommendation, but I did note that uh, Councillor Bolter, or I think, no, it's Councillor Morris, wanted a note to the applicant regarding making sure the drainage was acceptable for the residents of Crete Avenue. Yes. yes, Chair, that, that, that's correct. Regarding the drainage, um, something that we can be done to avoid Crete Avenue and the Army Barracks. OK. Well, I think we should actually do a vote on adding that note to the applicant before we move to the vote on the main item. So could I just have a show of hands on all those that agree with adding that note to the officer's recommendation to grant. If you could raise your hands now. Chair, I have all members except Councillor Bolter indicating. I'm going to unmute Councillor Bolter um, for any comment. Councillor Bolter. I did raise my hand, Chair, if you're not going through, I don't know why. OK, we will accept that, that you agree with adding that note then? Yes, definitely. OK, so I will formally move the application to grant with the addition of that note. Do I have a seconder? I believe Councillor Broadley had indicated, Chair. Councillor Broadley? Thank you, Chair. I will second the motion. OK. So the application has been moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Broadley, with the addition of the note to the applicant regarding drainage. We will now go to the vote, and I will hand over to Mr Ball to carry out that vote. Thank you, members. Uh, you have all been unmuted for the purposes of this recorded vote. Um, I will call out all members' names in alphabetical order by surname, and I require you to say for, against, or abstain uh, in terms of the substantive motion. Um, Councillor Bentley. For. Councillor Bolter. For. Councillor Linda Broadley. For. Councillor Frank Broadley. For. Councillor Hack. For. Councillor Joshi. For. Councillor Kaufman. For. Councillor Kozlowski. Oh. Councillor Lloyd -O. Um, In the interest of consistency, I will abstain. Councillor Morris. Oh. Councillor Ridley. Oh. Bear with me two seconds, Chair. Mr. Tucker, I have uh, four. Uh, sorry, a 10 votes for, zero against, one abstention. I have the same. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So that application then is granted. Chair, if you give me two seconds, I'm going to uh, mute all uh, participants once more. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we will now move on 
to the second and third application, which we shall take together. This is application 1900523, Reserve Matters, Land Opposite Stoughton Farm Park, and 1900524, Reserve Matters, also Land Opposite Stoughton Farm Park. We have two speakers, uh, Councillor Allen, and could I confirm when, if Mr. Tom Ayres is actually online? Mr. Tucker. I can confirm he is, Chair. Okay, yeah, can I should... just make an interjection? Can, for the record, can it be shown that Councillor Hack has left the meeting having previously declared an interest on this matter? Okay, thank you very much. We have noted that. Chair, I'm going to uh, now uh, allow Councillor Alam to um, to become an active participant in the meeting as the ward councillor. If you give okay. me two seconds to uh, confirm his connection. Councillor Alam, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Samuel, can you hear me? Can you see yes, me? Yes, and we can see you. Thank you. Um, Chair? All right, Councillor Allen, as we are taking both of the sec this second and third applications at the same time, you have five minutes to speak on each of them, so you have a total of ten minutes to speak. Okay, you will be given a nod when you've got one minute left if you require that. Okay, carry on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good evening to all members on um, <clears throat> development control. Um, as a ward councillor and as a resident of the Odebu Games Ward, I wanted to take this opportunity really to express some of the sentiments of my uh, fellow residents and also challenge some areas uh, of this application. Um, <clears throat> one of the charms of living in Odebu, I suppose, is the fact that we've got um, a very green and luscious environment. We've got uh, low levels of uh, traffic that flow through the, the, the borough. And we've got a very strong and well-established infrastructure, um, which helped, helps support the local residents. Um, what I see with this application is unfortunately it undermines all of that. And it's caused a lot of anxiety, uh, which is festered within the community. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have expressed their opinions, which have also been expressed within this report, and I can see that. The residents also understand that there is a national appetite to increase the housing stock, and they understand that this council has worked diligently to really try and um, bring a balance to the situation, which is national and, and local. And, um, and a lot of that is also expressed within this report. Um, if I go to the report, there is areas which I'd urge the committee to really have a look at in a little bit more further detail. One area of the report, um, which is regards to highways, um, on page 29, um, the applicant, it's the it's third paragraph down, the applicant has designed the road servicing plot for 194 to 244 at 5.5 meters, which should necessitate a 25 meter forward visibility envelope. Given the double bend, the geometry in this instance is a forward visibility of seven meters, of seven meters will be accept acceptable. It is assumed that this is due to the double bend. Now that word <laughs> assumed, um, I think needs to be pressed upon a little bit further because obviously if there's an accident, then you know how is that going to be justified? Um, with regards to just generally the area, if you look at the roads uh, around uh, Stoughton Farm Park, they're very narrow. And if we're gonna have um, haulage lorries and various things coming down those roads, it's obviously going to cause some, possibly some damage to the roads and a bit of a collateral damage. And I was wondering whether or not the applicant is going to um, is, is, you know, understands um, some of that and they can be held to account. Um, another area is on page 31, open spaces. Um, I think it's the second paragraph within that uh, particular area. It says local equipment area, and it's just the last sentence, local equipment area and play um, 
and uh, of play and inform recreational opportunities for teens in one of the wooded areas. Now, when I see the word teens in wooded areas, that does cause me a little bit of anxiety there as well. And I was wondering whether or not there's going to be anything with regards to that, um, you know, supporting supporting this development. Um, I understand, obviously, the trees are being protected, and I do welcome mm. the recommendations in this. Um, however, <clears throat> I think we need to go a little bit further and have a look at some of the drainage, in particular in this area. One of the reports, it does talk about the fact that um, some of the surface water drainage strategy, there is a plan there. However, the LPA, the, um, the application of this document uh, was submitted, was insufficient for the LL. FA to provide a substantive report. And I was wondering, and I was urging whether or not the committee could just press a bit upon that. There's also some issues regarding the heritage houses. The, um, uh, they've got some uh, significant historic value with regards to the lodges and they're quite old. And if there's lots of work going on in the environment, then you know possibly those walls and those foundations could potentially be you know, unsecure and something needs to be done um, with regards to that. Um, in a nutshell, I do say that the recommendations do help support the residents with some of their anxiety. However, there is a lot more that needs to be looked at and needs to be pressed upon. I think some of the consultations need to be a little bit, there needs to be a little bit more detail within the consultations as well. So I urge the officers and I mm. urge the, um, the committee to really hold this development to account and in particular look at the section 106 money that's being distributed for the 106 project. Um, you know, the reality, the ground reality is something different. If you've got more children or more people coming into this into this part of, of the borough, then have we got adequate enough school spaces? Have we got enough children, um, you know, enough, of, enough places within the school? And is, how is the 106 money going to support that in reality in terms of um, the local surgeries? How is the 106 money going to go and support that? I would urge the committee to really find these answers out um, because, you know, there still is a little bit of anxiety within the, the development, and I understand that. And hopefully, you know, you can bring this to some sort of a, con um, you know, a positive conclusion, um, which you have done for, for quite some time. And the residents understand that as well. So um, that's my uh, few minutes there that I just wanted to talk to you with regards to this, um, this development. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan, would we have Mr. Tom Ayres on now, please? Chair, before I bring Mr. Ayres in, do you, any members have any points of clarification uh, for Councillor Alam? If so, please indicate. No hands raised, Chair. I, uh, Councillor Alam, I'm now going to place you back into the view only section of the meeting. Okay. Daniel? Yes. Councillor Broadley raised her hand. Sorry, uh, Councillor Broadley. Thank you, um, Chair. I, I was just wondering, I, I take on board everything that Councillor Allen has said, but this application is just for the reserve matters. So can we go into that much detail because these are reserve matters, not the application, because the application for the houses to be built has actually already been approved. I, I just want clarification that can we ask all these questions as I it think is that, reserve matters only. I think that's a question to ask within the actual debate, Councillor Broadley. Although it's a very good question, I think that really needs asking in the debate. I don't think Councillor Allen would be the one to actually answer that. The questions at this moment in time should be to <laughs> Councillor Allen for clarification. But that question, yes, is a very good question, but needs Sorry, to be I was done within the debate. Nicole, whether we could. Ag again. Oh. I think the, the chair is right. I mean, uh, Councillor Allen can't answer that question. I would wait until Mr. Ayres has spoken. Then, if you want to make that question as the first question that comes in, I'll happily respond to it at that point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm now going to um, 
place Councillor Allen into the view only section of the meeting and then I will um, allow Mr Ayres um, in as an active participant. If you give me two seconds, thank you. Mr. Ayres, can you confirm that you can see and hear? Good evening. Yes, I can hear. Thank you. Mr. Ayres, could you possibly start your uh, video feed for us, please? Yeah. There you go. Can you see me okay? Yes, thank you. Chair? Okay, Mr. Ayres, uh, as we're taking both these applications at the same time, you will be allowed five minutes per application, so you have ten minutes, and we will give you a nod when you've got one minute left. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Chair. Good evening, Members. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I promise not to take up too much of your time this evening. Uh, I just wanted to thank your officers on behalf of the applicant, Bellway Homes, for working closely with us on this application and getting it before you tonight at this um, inaugural virtual committee meeting. Um, the application, as you know, seeks reserve matters consent for 310 dwellings in accordance with the outline uh, application as, uh, as indicated by Councillor Broadley. Uh, we fully support the report's recommendation for approval. Uh, we've worked particularly closely on this application with your heritage officers to ensure the layout and the design of the residential dwellings protects the setting of nearby listed buildings and uh, we're delighted the heritage officer is able to support the proposed mm. development. And indeed that there are also no objections from any other statutory consultees. I, I do acknowledge the concerns that Councillor Alam uh, raised, um, but uh, I, I, I also note that, the, that there are no objections from County Highways Authority. And we also worked very closely with the, um, the Highway Authority to ensure that the, you know, there were no highway safety issues and that the design and layout of the development met all their required standards. Uh, in terms of drainage, I, I also note the, um, the concern raised, but I would remind members that there is um, a condition on the outline consent which requires a detailed drainage strategy for the site to be approved and we um, that condition is outstanding and obviously we will be looking to submit a suitable proposal to discharge that condition in due course. This site is a real priority for Bellway, and uh, despite the current challenges, market and health related challenges, mm -hmm. they are fully committed to getting on site and delivering new homes for the community here as quickly as possible in the event of permission being granted this evening. Um, there's already been a good level of interest in the site from prospective purchasers, and certainly from our perspective, that's regarded as a very positive indicator of continued mm. market interest in new homes at this location at this time. And also that the site will prove to be attractive to local people, you know, looking for a new home. It obviously will make a significant contribution to housing supply in the district. But importantly, the Section 106 package agreed at outline application stage is budgeted for by Bellway and remains viable. And therefore, the, the benefits of that, which will include 30% affordable housing, uh, financial contributions for education, uh, public transport, healthcare, and uh, sporting facilities will all be provided for. Uh, of course, in addition to the significant amount of on-site open space. And again, I acknowledge Councillor Lamb raised the, that part of that will include wooded, wooded areas, but also will also include separate areas of open space, including children's play equipment. Um, so that will come forward in conjunction with the separate application, which of course will secure a new car park for the public house and the commercial buildings. And that will be a significant improvement on the current, um, current mm -hmm. conditions of the car park there. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. If I could just finally just commend the council on, on putting the arrangements in place to hold this virtual committee meeting in place so quickly. Um, 
uh, it's very much appreciated by the applicants and um, I do hope that other councils will follow suit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ayres. Mr. Ball, would you like to ask if anybody would like to raise their hand to ask any questions of clarification to Mr. Ayres? I think you've said it, Chair. Any member who wants to ask a point of clarification, if they could indicate. Chair, I have no hands raised, therefore I will um, place Mr. Ayres back into the view. Oh, sorry, Councillor Kaufman has now raised his hand, Chair. Councillor Kaufman? Yeah. Sorry, Chair, I was not quite quick enough with the mouse. Um, Mr. Mr. Ayres made mention of the amenity areas um, that are going to be provided on the site. Can you tell me, are those going to be amenity areas that are going to be adopted by the local authority? Or is it, as seems to be the habit with a lot of developers these days, um, the purchasers are going to have to um, contribute to a private company that it won't be public open space it will be open space for the use of the residents I wondered if uh, uh, you could tell me the proposals for that Mr Ayres yes thank you councillor yes the as is as is often the case the 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 public open space will be uh, uh, under the management of a private management company um so it, it yes it will be managed privately um and uh, that will ensure obviously the upkeep of the um public open space areas uh, are undertaken for residents uh, and by residents um going forward so that that's the arrangement in place Okay. Can I ask, just to clarify, will it mean that the amenity space is open for the use of the public? Yes. Well, the, uh, the, they will be predominantly for use for, uh, for residents, councillor, um, but obviously the um, areas are, are publicly ex will be publicly accessible. Um, and so, um, yes, the, they will be available for use of the public if, if that's so uh, the, uh, the option that uh, the public wish to use. But obviously they are designed to be part of and in conjunction with the delivery of this particular development and predominantly for, um, for the residents of that development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, um, sorry, Chair, I need to uh, place Mr Ayres into the uh, view only uh, section we have of the a, meeting. We have a hand up by Councillor Joshi. Chair, can you hear yep. me? I just I need to remove Mr Ayres from the meeting um, so he can have a view only. Okay. Uh, no, hold on, <laughs> Mr Ball. Oh, I'm sorry, I do Councillor apologise. Joshi has her hand up. I do apologise, Chair, sorry. Councillor Joshi. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, sir, Sam. And thank you, Mr Ayres. Sorry, my mouse was playing the same game as uh, Councillor Kaufman's. Um, <laughs> my concern, uh, and thank you for everything that you've clarified. I think I, I'm also a ward councillor for the Grange Ward, and I know inevitably the flooding and the drainage has always been a big issue, especially the uh, roundabout at Stoughton Road and Gartry Road. It's always flooded, um, even when... You know, there is no other issues apart from just rain. So do you have any idea when the county council or the local flood authority, that is, uh, when will they give you that sort of the, the, the results of the further work that they need to do on that? Well, I think the 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 uh, the details of the flood scheme will be contained within the planning condition that uh, as i said we will be proposing to share the details with the authority as part of a discharge condition application in due course and that application is um due to be submitted very very shortly so we expect that will be shared of course with the flood authority and they'll be given the opportunity to consider that in detail as part of that um, that that application um, so obviously we will respond to anything, any concerns that they raise in respect to that to make sure that the, um, you know, the drainage strategy for the site is, is to, okay. their, to their standards. I think if I can just, sorry, can I just... Um, yes, carry on. That. So if, if they come back and say, let's be negative about it, say they come back and says, oh no, the, the, you know, there's major issues with this site, what would be the condition then? Would there be something else that's put in place or... Would the plans have to be changed? 
Well, I think the scheme is designed, I mean, obviously the, there's an outline consent in place, which is which establishes what the sort of the, the principle for development, and that includes the principle for a, you know, the drainage, drainage, drain for, for how the drainage scheme could be could be um, could be managed, um, and so um, what we'd look to do is is provide details which add to the sort of in principle agreement that was made at the outline stage. Um, so we're confident that the site can accommodate a drainage strategy which would accord with that on the basis that the of the detailed layout that's been put forward for you. Now, obviously, there is a degree of flexibility within that, but we would ex we would clearly expect for it to. Uh, for it to for it to you know for it to comply with the the details so that we're looking and seeking approval as part of this application. Yeah, can I interject? We're now going from clarification. We are, I, was just going to, I was just going to say the same thing that we need to start moving those sort of questions into the actual debate. If that's okay, okay. Councillor Joshua. That's fine. No problem. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. okay, Mr. Ball. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. Redford, would you like to give your report? Mr. Redford, if you could give me two seconds whilst I share on the screen the planning presentation. Um, um, I, okay. Thank you. Mr. Redford, can you see the presentation on your screen? Yes, Sam, thank you. <clears throat> you can uh, present your report. Um, could we move the presentation to screen 13, please, Sam? <coughs> Slide 13. Uh, page, the one number 13, yes. No, page 13. That is page 13, Mr. Redford. Which... Look at the bottom left. It's number 11, Sam. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, obviously, as we've said already, uh, we're going to do one presentation covering both submissions um, with subsequent decision made on both separate. The, 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 the slide in front of you, there's, there's two areas enclosed in red that forms one application, which is for 310 houses, the reserve matter submission for 310 houses with scale, layout, appearance and landscaping, uh, with the associated internal road layouts, location of open spaces, etc. The area located within the blue edge on that drawing is the subject of the other, other reserved matters submission, uh, and that is for the car park. Now, if we can move to the next slide. This slide shows the internal the proposed internal layout for the, for the 310 housing 10 houses so you can see the larger parcel there has got an access point on the northern boundary of the site as well as the eastern that they're, they're both highlighted with yarrow within there you've got one road that connects the pair of them off which all other roads and private drives access Got a large woodland in the northwest corner along the balancing ponds just to the south of that wooded area. There's also a wooded area towards the south of the site, uh, centrally located, as well as a smaller area of open space to the south of the bottom access uh, onto Stoughton Road. In terms of the northern parcel for the housing, uh, you can see there that there's an access point off. Um, Gartree Road into the site with a what would be a balancing pond to the to the left to the west with a housing behind that. Now you will hopefully see from that small northern part of the site that just outside the red edge on Gartree Road there are two what are two existing houses. They are the listed cottages by way of reference. Um, so if you move to the next slide, now this shows the, the, the wider landscaping areas um, within the site. 
with the next slide, uh, the next few slides, um, all showing a variety of the different host types um, within the proposed scheme. Uh, if we keep going, Sam, on the slides, please. Right there, if you stop at that one, um, when Outline Planning Commission was given, um, one of the conditions imposed related to the phasing of the scheme, i.e. were they going to build it all at once or were they going to build it over a number of phases? This drawing, it's been shown for both uh, submissions, shows the phases. So on the larger part of the south, you've got two phases, uh, phase 1A, and to the lower portion of the site, uh, shaded purple, whereas the area to the, in shaded green to the north of that site is phase 1B. So they'll do the bottom bit first, then move up to the top. The bit on the right um, for the car park and the northern phase of housing, um, the housing element will be the second phase, whilst the car park will be phase one. So they will do the car park, <coughs> Then they'll do phase 1A, 2, 1B, and then 2. Now, if we can move, Sam, to page 29 on the slides, please. Yeah, thank you. This shows the layout of the car parking area. So the grey, the dark grey shaded areas are the actual parking areas. The little yellow dots are where there are going to be lighting serving serving the, the car park. The green area is landscaping, soft landscaping between the car park element and the housing immediately to the left as you look of it. The bit to the right, just outside the red edge, are the adjacent commercial units that the car park will serve. So that's the likes of the cow and plow, there's a, a barber's hairdressers there. There's a wedding dress shop there. So the car park will serve them. To move to the next slide, these are the lighting columns that are going to be in that car park area. There's two different heights. The highest one is just marginally over one metre high. So they're going to be quite low. Um, they're going to be efficient lighting um, that will give out enough light, but not so much light as to detract from the from, from the ecology that use the, the area um, in terms of sort of bats and, and nighttime things. So if we can move back up, Sam, to um, the first slide on, uh, actually on page 14, please. Slide 14, page 14. Right, so the two applications are um, for 310 houses on one reserve matters, car parking on the other. With regards to the um, car parking, not car parking, the housing element, the submission is as set out in the main agenda, um, along with all of the full details of the country key responses received and the responses received from local residents. No further consultee responses or <clears throat> neighbour responses have been received, so it is as per the main agenda. The main consideration, starting on page 26 of the committee report, goes through the layout of the proposal on, on both parcels and collectively, um, as well as the scale. There's a small number of bungalows and flats in there, most of them are two-storey houses, but going up to two-and-a-half-storey houses with the, the upper storey uh, located in the roof slope and uh, the roof void served by dormer windows. A variety of different host types and appearances which um, have got features in evident in the, in the local amenity to, to enable it to fit in. Um, we have got an extensive landscaping scheme as part of both submissions. Um, and this comprises soft and hard landscaping. Um, so we are satisfied that based on all of those elements, um, the proposal is, from the officer's perspective, acceptable. Obviously, 
access was considered as part of the outline planning application, at which point the, the access points were considered and approved. Now, through the consideration of the housing reserve matters, there's been extensive dialogue between officers, the agents and, and county highways in order to make sure that the internal road layouts are such that they are fit for purpose, are safe, and comply with the county standards. Now, I'll take this opportunity to, to just comment on the point raised by uh, Councillor Allen in respect of the, um, the, the paragraph, third paragraph in on page 29 of the report and the use of the word assumed. When the county highways provided their final comments, setting out that everything was acceptable from their point of view, they, they made four comments. The vast majority of what is in the highways element of the report is taken, taken exactly from the county response. The sentence, it is assumed that this is due to the double bend having the effect of slowing traffic down thus reducing the need for greater visibility was inserted by me as, as the case officer for this. Unfortunately, the county did not clarify why they were satisfied that a 17 metre visibility would in this instance be acceptable when it that should necessitate, necessitate a 25 metre visibility. Um, I have asked the question. I've not, however, had clarification on that point. But nonetheless, the county highways have said that the visibility at that point, at 17 metres, is acceptable. So taking everything to account in terms of the layout for the housing scheme, highways are, are satisfied that the proposal is acceptable and will not impact um, within the development or beyond the development uh, to a level that would justify a, a refusal being issued. <coughs> Now, in respect of the, the other question um, or point raised by Councillor Allen, in respect of the teen open space provision, um, as part of the submission, it was indicated that the, the teen area would be in the uh, one of the wooded areas. It's not densely wooded, but it, it's wooded the space there. Um, we considered it um, between the, myself as development control officer and the and my policy, planning policy colleagues. And it was considered that it wasn't normal, but it wasn't unacceptable. We are satisfied that it is acceptable. It was proposed by Bellway, and we thought and think and believe uh, it is acceptable. Um, so from the amenity point of view, we are happy as well. Um, as Mr. Ayers, set out in his presentation There's, there was also a bit of dialogue between officers the agents and county heritage with regards to the relationship of a number of plots on the northern portion of the housing site with the two listed buildings adjacent to it as a result of those dialogues um some of the house types have been on that northern portion have been changed the layouts have been altered and reorientated in order to uh, provide a better and more enhanced distance between the new dwellings and those existing list buildings to the point where I set out in the report, um, the heritage officer and our, the, our officers are satisfied that there will be no impact on heritage assets. Now, um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the flooding and drainage matters. Um, in their consultation response, the county flooding highlighted that more information was needed. Um, I've addressed this in the report, uh, on the agenda report on page 33. Um, in short, the information that the county as lead local flood authority were after that is due to be provided by way of other conditions attached to the outline. The fact that we don't have it now isn't reason for refusal. We will get it. If there is an issue, there will be the opportunity for that to be addressed 
through dialogue to make sure that the drainage issues um, and flooding issues on site are acceptable. They, they are not exacerbated or made worse as a result of the development. With regards to the moving on a step to the, the car parking element of the submission, <coughs> um, as our officers were satisfied with the layout, um, however, the, the yet yeah, again, good dialogue and good interaction with local lo the local businesses that the car park serve, um, the public house actually raised questions as to whether their vehicles could actually manoeuvre to leave in a forward gear. Um, as a result of this, the agents and the, the highway consultants have we've done tracking, it's been submitted. We are satisfied that the vehicles used to make deliveries and collections from, from the public house, as well as the other commercial units there, can enter the site in the forward gear, as well as safely manoeuvre within the site to actually leave in the forward gear. So straight away by that, we are satisfied as our county highways, that the layout of that car park would not result in any detrimental impact on um, highway safety, highway or pedestrian safety. Mm. Um, in terms of landscaping across the whole development, we are satisfied, we are happy. It, it, it works well with each other as well as the wider area. Um, one other thing I would like to highlight um, with regards to the conditions on the condition two on the housing element of the application and um, on condition two of of that um housing scheme on page 38 of the agenda um i have omitted accidentally um, words relating to the, the, the flank wall windows being obscure glazed. If the committee is minded to discharge these conditions and approve the development with the conditions discharged on those conditions, I would need to add words into that condition number two to ensure it actually is fit for purpose. Um, it, it's uh, should read all flank windows shall be fitted with obscure glazing. So between the words with and then on the first line, obscure word, obscure glazing needs to be inserted. Subject to that, both submissions are recommended for approval. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Redford. Before we move on, um, just need to reiterate that we are taking both applications at the same time. So if you need to speak on this, please make sure that you state which application you are commenting on. Also, I need to reiterate that we will be voting on each of these recommendations separately. So we will do two votes at the end. Okay. Councillor Broadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry for jumping in a bit too early earlier on, okay, uh, but if my question can be posed now on um, the valid points that Councillor Allen made, um, can we go into depth on them? Because this is uh, reserve matters when the site already has outlined planning permission. Thank you, Chair and Councillor Broadley. Um, you're quite correct that you can't go into any detail. In essence, what you're being asked to do is, is to discharge the conditions uh, that were on the outline planning permission. And if you're satisfied that those conditions should be discharged, the net effect of that is that it, the development is permitted. As far as all the other matters that were concerned in terms of highways, open spaces, etc., the council has already entered into a legally binding section 106 <coughs> agreement with the uh, landowner straight developers, the consequence of that is that a lot of the, the other things that, that Councillor Allen were talking about are subject to um, a condition that, that the, the, for instance, the, the players have to be approved by the council before um, occupation of certain properties. So all of the things are covered off. All you're concerned about today is whether or not 
you can discharge those conditions. And if you do discharge those conditions, the consequence is that the permission uh, becomes a full permission and the developers can continue. Are you happy with that, Councillor Broadley? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Councillor Joshi did start to ask a question before, I will allow Councillor Joshi to speak next. So, Councillor Joshi. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really just about uh, what Richard just mentioned uh, at page 33 about the flooding and drainage. So it's the same sort of question that I asked Mr. Ayres earlier. Um, if we are still waiting for that decision, um, can we stipulate some conditions on these? I don't know how it works within reserve matters, whether we're allowed to or not, to say that whilst we go ahead with the approval, we would like to have that um, report about the flooding aspects, whether it's positive or negative and, and what the next stage is. I don't know whether that can be built into the, the actual uh, application. Mr. Redford. If I make any sense. <laughs> yeah, you do. Thank you. Mr. Redford. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, when the outline permission was granted, there was a raft of conditions put on and there are a number relating specifically to flooding and drainage. Um, as well as the maintenance of the likes of the balancing ponds that are proposed, so that we can ensure that not only are flooding and drainage matters addressed satisfactorily to, to the to the satisfaction of the the body that would be responsible for looking after maintaining them, i.e., the county as the the flood authority, but also that there's a long term strategies for their for their maintenance. Uh, to make sure that they actually remain effective for a long period of time. Now, those conditions were on the outline permission. Um, as part of this, um, we consulted environmental health as well and Seven Trent. Neither have come back asking for conditions and bits. So I, I'm satisfied that the conditions on the outline will serve the purposes uh, that you are seeking to, to secure. They're, they're already there, is, is what I'm saying. Thanks there, Joshi. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bolter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on the first application, um, I'm, I'm concerned now that um, the open space and the balancing pond, the Mr. Gill will know where I'm coming from, is being maintained by a company set up by the, by the builders to be paid into by the, by the residents. Um, the fees for this, of course, are limited. Um, so I hope residents realise that when they actually purchase the properties. Also, I don't know <clears> whether I misheard, but um, I also thought I heard that the roads won't be adopted either. This would be an additional cost onto the residents. Now, if that's the case, then the drains won't be adopted either. So we've now got the drains, the roads, the lighting, if any lighting's there, and all the open space and the balancing pond all charged the residents to maintain. Now, um, as I said before, these charges are unlimited. So you might start off at a small amount of money, but uh, over a few years, that money just builds up quite considerably. Now, that concerns me. I could have heard that wrong, but I'll wait to be corrected. And on the second application, I noticed that on the, um, the diagram we were given, that the lighting for the car park was solar lighting. Now, that's fine, maybe in the late spring and the summer, but what about the winter? Um, my experience is that solar lighting doesn't work pretty well in the winter. And as we have more winter in this country than <coughs> summer, I can see these car parking spaces being dark more than their light. So that's an answer to that one, please. Mr. Redford. Um, yes, Chair. I'll deal with those backwards, if I may, Councillor Bolter. With regards to the lighting, I'm actually just zooming in on the, um, the, the technical details for, for, for that. Um, they do have a built-in photo cell on the top to aid operation, but uh, from reading it, they will also be, I believe, be wired in. So even when in the middle of winter and there isn't any light, they will still light up in the evening. So patrons using it will actually be safe. Um, and that said, with regards to the highways, um, part of the reason that these applications are coming to you now and 
not last month or the month before, uh, was because we've been having long dialogue involving um, highways. Now, there, all the roads have been adopted, to my knowledge, to be adopted by, by the county highway, highways department. There may be one or two small private driveways that won't be, but the main vehicular traffic uh, roads will, to my knowledge, be, be adopted. Um, because the, the whole dialogue involving the county and, and the agents was to make sure that the roads meet the highway standards um, to make sure that they are capable of being adopted and capable of doing everything they need to um, from the highway perspective as well as the drainage perspective. So I, does, does that help clarify, uh, Councillor? Um, Mr. Bolter, you also mentioned the bones in pond. Can I interject on that one? Uh, experience yeah. elsewhere in the borough, uh, we have major problems now with these spur bits of road which aren't adopted, uh, which forms the responsibility of the people who live on those spur roads, and also the um, maintenance and balancing ponds and various things. Uh, I understand the council has got no powers to enforce this. Um, but it is uh, getting quite um, heated discussions elsewhere in the borough when um, the company doesn't maintain these areas, yet the residents are being charged an awful lot of money for work that doesn't take place, and there's no redress for that whatsoever. Thank you. Could Mr. I just Gill? interject on that point, Chair, yeah. uh, with regard to the balancing ponds um, and open spaces? It's a matter of policy in, in many cases why we don't take them on, because Councillor Bolt has made the point that this is a, a, an extra burden on those particular ratepayers, which is true, but if we take them on, it becomes a burden on every other ratepayer. The fact of the matter is that when these properties are purchased, the buyer willingly enters into a contract, they have legal advice, they're fully aware that the, the way that the, the uh, subsystems and the, and the public open spaces is going to be maintained, and it's a matter for them to deal with their managing company. If the managing company is not dealing with the matter, then they have a right of action against the management company, not the council's role to step in where there's been a bad bargain between uh, owner occupiers and their management agents. And as a general principle, we don't take them on because as they're becoming more common, they're becoming more difficult to maintain. We would require additional equipment. We would require additional staff, additional training, uh, and the, the cost of that, we would get no benefits of scale that a large management company gets. All of that cost would have to be borne by this authority and spread amongst all of the, the other ratepayers. So I understand the sentiment. I appreciate why Councillor Bolt has raised it, but my advice is that's not a matter that you should be taking into account when you're considering this, this application and the discharge of these conditions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bolt, do you want to come back on that? Um, well, we always agree to differ with Mr Gill. But um, it's just that um, very often residents don't ask the solicitor the right question when they purchase property. Then when the purchase is too late and they get landed with this large maintenance bill year on year, which increases at least 4% year on year. Uh, so after a few years, uh, it is a tremendous bill, extra bill for residents. And of course, they turn around and say, well, we pay our council tax. What are we getting for it? Your answer is not as much as somebody who moved into property 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a, okay. a bone of contention and something that really needs to be looked at, if not by this authority, by a greater authority. Um, not only the fact that this is being done, but also that the fees are unlimited. And that's the bit that concerns me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Bolter. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you. Look, this is going to be a rare occasion. I absolutely agree with Councillor Bolter. Um, and my son, in the last year, has bought a Bellway home um, out of the borough. And I was very concerned when I realised he didn't realise, but because I've been in this game long enough, what he was taking on. But the people on the, these estates are, in fact, paying council tax twice. Once to the local authority and once to whatever management company. And I continually read in the, in, in, in the press problems. I'm not 
impugning Bellway this time, but with other developers and other management companies. And we've really got to learn. There are two things that worry me. I think I read from, from the report, it's, if, it, if it's less than four houses, uh, uh, the county won't adopt the road. That worried me. Um, and this idea where residents will get together to maintain something, to make storing up problems for the future, to turn what looks nice now into a slum estate. We have problems already in areas where there are shared garage spaces, where everybody has a garage place in a, but nobody can get together to maintain the area. And I was just wondering, I, I've looked here a lot, are any of these areas, particularly with the social housing, the 30% social housing, where the garaging is going to be, um, garage spaces are going to be plots that are going to have to be maintained by the individual owners, but nobody can get together to service a whole area. I've seen a lot of that in the Granger State and the problems now the number of years have gone by, because the problem is once developers move off the state, they tend to lose interest and enforcing covenants and things like that. So I really do worry what looks nice and great now, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you've got a potential slum problem with neighbors not getting on and doing things. So can I ask, is there any way that we can insist that any amenity areas are taken over by the council via 106 money to keep them going, which I thought was the way these things operated, and B, are there any areas where there's communal garaging? Mr. Redford? With regards to communal garaging, not in the sense of garage blocks, no. Um, there are one or two areas where um, <clears throat> the, the, the car parking is, is open plan. Um, Obviously, this will be taken on in, in most of the instances by a housing association who will be responsible for its maintenance on that. Um, so what else was there you asked Kevin kind of stick off me? The other question was concerning whether or not there's any way that we could um, take on the, the public open spaces. Arguably, yes, we could, but that's a policy decision. And the current policy is that we don't want to take them on because they are... A liability going forward we might get a commuted lump sum that commuted lump sum might cover five or ten years worth of maintenance and then after that the council has got to find the money to continue to maintain it um okay. when did we make that policy okay. can i ask thank you we, we're moving off we're moving off the application now well then any, can more, I, can any more specific can, questions councillor Kaufman? yes um we're talking about the housing association properties under housing associations, they, there is this right to buy, isn't there? So once the, if the occupants enforce their right to buy, whose job will it be to maintain these communal parking areas? These communal parking areas cause a lot of social nuisance. And they get to the, once the surface is gone, whose right will it be once they've all had the right to buy enforced? Very them? quickly on that one, just to deal with it. If somebody purchases a property from a housing association through a right to buy system, they will be paying service charges for the maintenance of the public open spaces and car parks within that area. And that is common practice. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, Councillor Kaufman, before I move on? No, thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Ridley. Thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully this is not an naive question, but it's the first time as Council about a year that come across such a, or to seeing this such a big development through. Um, the, um, I know we're the borough council, so we don't have authority over highways, um, but how do we feed into that as councillors and a, as a borough? I'm thinking of both the internal um, uh, plan for the site and also access points. Have we missed that boat? Um, I just like it clarified. I know it's not quite that. That, that was all done within the outline planning permission. Mr okay. Redford, you'd like to confirm that? 
Yes, Chair. Um, the, the access points physically into the site from, in this case, Stoughton Road and Gautry Lane were dealt with at the outline stage. The internals have been addressed here through the dialogue between ourselves, the agents and the county highways um, arrangement. Obviously, this is a, a reserved matters on an outline. It's that way. If it was a full application with everything at once, we would deal with everything at the same time. Does, does that help, uh, Councillor Ridley? Yeah, I mean, my main concern is just looking at the internal plan is that road, I shoot from the two access points, that would be two separate roads in, rather than one through road, which it fits. Um, but is that not finalised now, or is it finalised? Mr Redford? Uh, assuming um, an approval, um, that layout as shown on the drawing would be finalised from the planning perspective. Okay, I, th I just think we missed the boat there because that looks like a rat one and waiting to happen. So, okay. Um, okay, Councillor Riddler. Uh, Councillor Joshi. Okay, just before I bring Councillor Joshi in, um, it's a, a 10 minute warning. Um, the, the nation marks uh, the clap for carers, clap for our NHS, and clap for key workers at 8 pm. Should the meeting go in, uh, to eight o'clock or near to eight o'clock, um, I will interject um, for us to pause the meeting so we can clap along virtually. Okay. That's fine. Okay, that's great. Councillor Joshi. Joshi. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think uh, Councillor Ridley's asks, asked the same question that I was going to ask, actually, but with a caveat being that we may have missed the boat because I've looked at the access points. They're in <clears throat> two roads, which are really, really congested with a lot of traffic. Uh, but my, my question is really on the Gartree Road end, um, because I've, I've been looking at the pictures on page 23 on the application number two, which is the Stoughton, opposite Stoughton Grange Park. Um, it looks like you come out of uh, Stoughton Grange and go straight into an access point from Gartree Road onto the site. Um, there's always a lot of traffic down that road and at night, so usually sort of past 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening, people are just driving at 60, 70 miles an hour on there. So my question is, is there a, is there a place where we can say, can we put some speed ramps in or speed bumps in or something like that just to slow the traffic down? Mm, I wouldn't have thought so, Mr. Redford. Yeah. I, we've missed the boat um, on that one. Yeah, I, we've missed the boat on that. Um, I also mm. know, well, at all level anyway, um, I know that as part of the outline, there is actually going to be a works there to facilitate safe entrance and, and exit, um, as well as works in relation to Shady Lane as well. Um, with regards to the likes of um, traffic calming measures, whilst we as a planning authority can't do anything that's the type of matter that could be raised with um the county council as the highway authority for this bit but it's one of those that would in my mind raise the question as to are we looking solely within the county council's area or would it also incorporate the city council whose boundary starts about 100 meters to the right um just around shady lane so yeah. it's one of those that may be a, a multi-council dialogue that needs to happen but at uh at the, the highway authority level so the county council for us okay okay thank, thank you. you chair can i just comment on the um internal vote layout um because i did mention uh, one of the pre-application meetings with the um highways authority and the applicant about the possibility of um that road becoming a rat run uh, and the Highways Authority was satisfied that it wouldn't on the basis of the entry and exit junctions um, slowing the traffic down. So they didn't feel that that road would create a quicker route than the existing route around the side of the development. OK, thank you, Mr. Fork. Right, I have no more speakers, so we're going to move on to the vote. Uh, we have two applications to vote on. Um, land opposite Stone Farm Park, which regards the uh, housing development, which is 1900523 reserved matters. Um, the recommendation is to discharge the conditions 2, 8 and 18. I will formally move that application and ask for a seconder. Councillor Broadley. Thank you, Chair. I will second your motion. Okay. So that application 19 forward slash 0023 forward slash 
Reserve Matters REM has been moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Broadley. Mr. Ball, could we go through the vote system on that, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just bear with me two moments. Um, I'm just having a technical difficulty on my end, if you can give me two moments, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, similar to other uh, the previous application members, I will call out your names by alphabetical order um, by surname, um, and I will ask you to indicate for, against, or abstain. Um, for this purpose, I will unmute you all. <coughs> Uh, Councillor Bentley. Or. Councillor Bolter. Or. Councillor Linda Broadley. Or. Councillor Frank Broadley. Or. Councillor Joshi. Or. Councillor Kaufman. Or. Councillor Kozlowski. Or. Councillor Lloydle. Or. Councillor Morris. Four. Councillor Ridley. Four. Chair, that's unanimous um, in favour of the application. Mr Tucker, have you got the same? Yep. Chair. Thank you. That application is granted then for the discharge of the conditions. We will now move on to the second application, which is 1900524, Reserve Matters regarding the car parking area. The application, which is to permit. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Frank Broadley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll second your motion. Thank you. So the application, 19.00524, forward slash REM reserved matters has been moved by myself to permit, seconded by Councillor Frank Broadley. Could we now move on to the vote, Mr Ball? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've once again unmuted all members. Um, once the vote is taken, um, if members can remain in order to uh, join in with the clap with the nation at eight o'clock. Councillor Bentley? Or Councillor Bolter? Or Councillor Linda Broadley. Or Councillor Frank Broadley. Or Councillor Joshi. Or Councillor Kaufman. Or Councillor Kozlowski. Or Councillor Lloydle. Or Councillor Morris. Or Councillor Ridley. Or uh, Chair, that's also unanimous in favour, Mr. Tucker. I think Mr. Tucker has indicated. Yep. Okay, thank you. That's unanimous. So again, that application is permitted. Uh, I thank you all for your attendance. This has been not, I wouldn't say difficult. The technology worked well. Uh, I think the meeting went quite well and I thank you all for your attendance and uh, formally close the meeting, but could we just stay to carry out the clap, please? Participants, I will mute you um, in the minute leading up and then I'll, I'll mute you again at eight o'clock. Thank you. Everybody's clapping, Mr. Ball. Thanks.